right, so I just want to clarify, when I say predictability, what I'm talking about is, you know, you say, yeah, I'm going to do it on time, like whatever date we agreed to, and it happens. Another supporting aspect to that would be, you can predict, oh, that kind of thing you want to be done? Well, yeah, that takes 85 days or less. That's the kind of predictability I'm talking about. So if there's like a different type of predictability you're interested in, I probably won't talk about it, unless you ask me at the end. Okay. First question, anybody ever use anything shaped like this at work right now? I didn't think so. Um, not, not many people are doing it. Not because they shouldn't, so they just don't know about it. Okay, uh, I want to start by making a histogram. That's why I wasn't going to show this. I was going to show how unscary and non-mathematical they actually are. But uh, can I get information from you? Uh, first, uh, what type of role or background do you have? Any designers? Nobody with a design background. Okay, how about you know marketing background, development background, couple two, general IT management, business back like your business side that you have taken or consult business business side also. And uh, actually, I should have just written basic product. Because that would be you, and then there's probably a couple more who would classify there. That's four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about uh, years of experience? One year of experience? Two? Three? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Which one? Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Uh, who said twelve? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, plus. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 in retrospect, I, everybody kept talking about how like everybody's a college kid here, but I, I definitely should have chunked this down into sets of five. But uh, uh, years of experience? Uh, 15. 15? Uh, like just years of experience. Um, sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. Okay. So we got a we got a messy uh, distribution here, but <laughs> it's basically uh, uh, something. So so these are all pulled up. So I'm going to exclude that. But uh, something like that. I'm not a mathematician, and I'm certainly not like gifted artist informed by math, but it's bigger here, and then there's kind of a long tail. That's, that's all that kind of thing is. It's not, anyway, that's it's as easy as what I just did to generate one of those. Okay, um, so does it say it up there? Yeah, it says lead time district. So it's, I already asked, uh, are people using shapes like this? at work right now? And everybody so far said no. Um, is the concept of lead time distribution familiar to you? Is the concept of lead time familiar to you? What's the difference between lead time and cycle time? It is a trick question, because it's actually debated by like experts. So I, I don't think it matters, it's terms. It probably matters to the organization you're working in. So just make sure you're, you're using the same words that they're using. Can you 
That's what Don Reinerton said, but uh, uh, it, 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 I'm going to define it for the purposes of, of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, just keep in mind, when you go back to work, lead time might be how much advance notice like you give the marketing people before they have to like start writing crafty ways of explaining your new feature. Yeah. What I'm going to talk about lead time is often referred to as cycle time. But you can also, some, some people will say they divide the total lead time by different cycle time. So it's, it's just terms. So what's this? Sorry for the bad ink. In the agile world, what do you think this might be? More specifically? Like this, this particular thing. Swim lane? Another terminology thing, usually swim lanes are horizontal, but it totally depends on where you are. But it, it, it's, it's a workflow. It's representing a workflow. A work starts on one side, goes to the other side. The question is, how long does it take? Actually, how long did it take? That question, that's answered by starting the clock somewhere, let's say here, and stopping the clock here. That's lead time. So if it took one day or it took 100 days to get to after it entered to exit, that's its lead time. Does that make sense? Sort of a fundamental premise to all this? And what cycle time? I mean, like, is that like a SDLT type cycle that you're working on? You could call that a cycle time also. So lead time and cycle time is exactly the same? Yeah. It, 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 the, the, both the, the terms... They're, uh, um, I don't know, I haven't looked them up in the dictionary, but I bet you definition one, two, and three are probably reversed, but they're the same words, defining both under the, each of the dictionary. They're, they're basically, seriously, read four different blogs, you'll get four different, well, maybe three different uses of them, but uh, don't worry so much about that. And what I'm mostly talking about is this. Actually, that's what I'll be talking about today. And let's say if you are just in the development group, and let's say, for example, not in the QA group, this is still useful for you because, as far as you're concerned, if you're just a dev team manager, you can measure when it entered here and when it left there. Because developers have their own workflow as well. Does that make sense? So scale-wise, that doesn't really matter. It's just when does it start, when does it end? for your purposes. And generally, as product people, I'm thinking more in this case of like, when is this epic going to be done? When is the story going to be done? OK? That level of granularity. OK. So that's out of the way. Uh, how do we get a reliable, predictable lead time? A probable, a, 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 a forecast of how long this, let's say this is like a, a work product. It takes a bunch of engineers, takes some designers, some, some QA, maybe installation, maybe DevOps. But this, this thing, a senior manager or customer saying, I want one of these. When can you have this done? That one. Not like how frequently do you get things done on average. When is this going to be done? So to answer that question, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So uh, there's some ingredients to be able to get one of those. And the first one is you need uh, countable units. So each one of you is an individual person. Uh, that gets plotted into this uh, distribution. It gets put on the charts. I put a dot on the chart. That's what I mean. Uh, for every work item, you need to have you know, something that you can count. So this work item is different from that work item. You've seen scrum boards. You notice like you can, in Jira, you can have like a list of work to do, but you can also have a board with cards. They're the same thing, but just different views. 
but the, the purpose of the card thing is so it's very easy for people who have no idea what you're talking about because they usually manage something else and they just walk into your meeting. They can see this and get, oh, that's different than that. That's, that's the purpose of that. Another is that you can very quickly count these things. Okay. But the a key thing to be able to make these curves useful is you need to know the difference Better pen, yeah. I even brought my own, but I didn't bring a black one. Yeah, no, that's bad. I'll use blue. I'm, I'm writing the words different types. You need to, you need to know the difference uh, between types of work. So let me quickly explain why. Bug fixes and new version releases are both work items. One is, here's a bug, fix this bug. The other one is, we want to release 3.0, release 3.0, please. Those are very different types of work. And you can imagine how many days one versus the other will take, especially on averages. And these aren't, you know, actually there's averages in here, just not a normal curve. Uh, they'll be totally different. So you'd have maybe a big spike of like the short bug fixes and then another big lump over here of like the version releases. So you want to separate those so that you're not including totally different kinds of things in the same chart. That's, that's all I wanted to say about that. But does that make sense? One thing you can do that will really make a difference in, uh, in the predictability as a product manager, it's not just separating what's the difference between a bug and a feature, but what's the difference between this kind of feature and that kind of feature. Like this one requires certification from uh, you know, the, the banking uh, certifying bodies. This one doesn't. And this one uh, has to go through UAT with uh, certain marquee customers. This one doesn't. Both new features, but they're different. So you can expect a different reaction out of these things. So when you can separate those out, people can say, hey, how long, or how long is it going to take you to give me a new feature that uh, uh, In a, new, a new feature that has to meet regulatory standards. You can give them a certain answer, as opposed to, you know, how long is it going to take you to make this uh, uh, cosmetic change? Well, we know because we separate the different types of work, cosmetic changes take a certain amount of days or less. Okay? So different, uh, separating the type of work out, even when, as far as you're concerned, they're all the same. It's all like new features. Separate those out. That will help you. Um, is that clear? All right. Uh, second, uh, model workflow. This is a simple model. Ready, doing, testing, done, that kind of thing. Uh, whatever your actual workflow is matters. For the purposes of getting a lead time distribution, meaning how long does it take from when we start this work to finishing this work, this can actually even be a black box. It doesn't even matter. That's why even if you're, uh, you know, if you're a manager and you're not in control of who's doing estimation on different things and you're not involved in that, that doesn't even matter to you. All you need to know is take your commitment, like what's your start point? And I would suggest it's when you actually have committed to doing it, not when it's just something you want to do. Start the clock once work gets started or once it gets accepted into a system that always does all the work it gets assigned. Does that make sense? That's a commitment point. And then whatever your definition of done is, that's the workflow. So you don't, really, you don't necessarily need to know this part here totally concretely or clearly, but you do need to know that. You need to know that so you can start the clock and stop the clock and get the, get the, the lead time. I would suggest 
You rarely do. Could you just throw in your number? No. What I'm suggesting is about to follow, no. but I'll give you a hint. Um, historical. This is a histogram, meaning you measure the past. So you have to have like a, some sort of previous yeah. And, and, and the spoiler alert, five, four, it's actually a little bit less than five mm -hmm. total. Right. And we kind of regardless of how big it turned out to be, just five, and you statistically, you have enough data to get a reliable curve. Okay. So it's... So this only will yeah. be applicable for the tax level for, let's say, um, maybe Spend a four. day or two. Uh, um, four not four 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 if you four radically four alter four the shape of a, a site, a group of the team, you're going to have unpredictability no matter what. Right. No matter, no matter. There's nothing you can do to stop that. Other, I mean, even 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 like really sophisticated yeah. models. Uh, mm -hmm. you, if you radically change this, the composition of your team, it's it's going to be less predictable. Uh, but in uh, I, I'm 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 starting. To, I don't want to get into the answer question sure. mode yet, but. Um, the, uh, the reason why, well, well yeah, uh, this is an alternative to looking at the work and inspecting it, trying to evaluate what's involved in this work and how long do we think this is going to take. It's, it's actually just regardless of any of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's happening and your company pays for it and you have a company policy where that has to happen, fine. Regardless of that, you can still do this and you don't need permission. You, you can do this. Um, okay, uh, what's about this stuff about? Yeah, modeling the workflow, commitment points. Uh, yeah, simple, measure how many days. So that just reiterates this very weak pen. But uh, this commitment point especially is very important. This one is too, this one is especially important. Knowing the difference between we have started this work or we haven't started this work. So if that's vague to you, so in many, many systems, it's totally vague. Many, many systems are not a pull system. They are a push system. People say, here's the work you have to do. The clock, as far as they're concerned, has already started. Account manager said yes. Three weeks later, you notice the email of the work that that account manager committed you to do it. Right? So that might be vague. That you just need to establish this very clearly because none of this will be accurate without that and you won't have predictability, okay? So I just want to ask you to think your workflow, where is that or where should it be? And who else do you need to talk to to be able to make sure that they also agree that any work before that commitment point is not necessarily committed and deciding not to do it is actually an option. Who else would you need to be talking to in your company to be able to do that? That, that would be a whole other discussion. Okay, and then it's as simple as you know, if, if it's hours is the more important metric, then it's how many hours, but I'm suggesting days. How many days does it take? So, each work item, you know, one nice thing about user stories, it's obvious when one is done. Even if the whole project's not done or the whole strategy's not done, one thing is done. I got one. So remember what I did here? Especially, I think it was number 12. Yeah. So one person said 12. I put one. Another person put 12. I put one right above that. So for each of the, in, in this case it was uh, years of experience, we're talking about how many days does it take to go through there, the lead time. We just had, we just say we finished a work item, it took us four days. <laughs> finished the second work item, it took us nine days. Third work item. So it's four days, All right? So eventually you end up filling out a, uh, a bunch of dots. And almost always, in fact always, 
going to look kind of like that. The, the average is going to be, in the mo I should say the mode, is going to be further this way, and there's going to be a longer tail. They just, you know, the way the world works. Unless you've mixed different kinds of work in there, of course, then it's really lumpy and you can't really use these effectively. But that's what you're going to get. So that's as simple as it is. Um, so each of you work in a different place. So the kind of work that your teams are doing, do they finish 5,000 per day? No. Like one a day, less than one a day? You don't need computers to do this. It's so, the volume is low enough that paper is fine. Just, just, as, just to let you know. You can use Excel, which is what this is, which as far as I know, most people are still using Excel because they haven't switched from Jira to a different tool. But um, that, that Excel is also very simple on this. So that's how you get the lead time distribution. And so now we can look at the slide. In this case, um, uh, the mode is not identified, but it's something yeah, around 40. So most of the time, most work items that got finished, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Most work items that got finished took 40 days. You know, maybe that's average. So do you want to tell the very, very aggressive marketing manager or business manager yeah, it'll take 40 days. Almost always does. It's average. And, and put your reputation online for that? No. You're smiling now. What would you want to tell the very eager, aggressive project or product or whatever, business person or customer? How long? Give me how many days to finish this for you. Not a million. It's got to be less than that. But how many, how many would you ask for looking at that chart? 60? Is 85% probable uh, delivery good enough? There's a nodding head, nodding head. Anybody else say no? <laughs> Depends on the customer, <laughs> absolutely. Are we talking about a uh, uh, successful um, uh, mm -hmm. iris, uh, whatever, you know, LASIK surgery? 85% of the time works? No. So it totally depends. You know, uh, f uh, collecting trash and throwing it away after hours. Do you have to have 85% reliability on that's how long it takes to collect the trash and throw it away when no one else is around? Yeah, you know, maybe 50% maybe of the time is fine. Some of your bugs, some of your other things like that might be 50%. But that would be a business decision based on risk. Okay, but... Um, Average is typically not what we care about. Uh, and, and we could easily not have to worry about that because we have something much more uh, specific that's actually quite reliable as well. Because if you, if you look at the tail, the tail is everything that goes to the right of that SLA line. This is a hypothetical user agreement saying, yeah, you get this stuff done for me 85% of the time less than 60 days, I won't make you have to give me an estimate. That's actually where this method started. Um, but anyway, uh, if you look at the tail to the right, there's like nothing, n barely ever is any work taking longer than that. And so those two times that it does happen, or usually when you have a very explicitly modeled visible workflow, you can see it going to happen. You can make some management decisions to affect that. But let's just say it is a black box and you're not in control of it. Yeah, you, you just know that. So if work has to be delivered by a certain date, how can you use this? I'll show you a picture. Yep. All right. So the question is, in this case, for scheduling, what should we start? What can we wait to start later? And maybe what should we just not even bother starting? All sorts of requests, customer requests, internal customer requests, my great ideas uh, that you know, uh, 
support for a certain uh, platform or uh, device that we haven't really quite gotten around to, but we still have all these forums complaining about it. All sorts of different things we can do. Which one should we start now, given limited capacity? And which ones should we delay, or can we delay without any penalty? Oh, yeah, I'm not in that mode. Unless you make it to the play mode. So I'm trying to get there. Eh. There it is. Come on. I was just doing this. That from current? Okay, sorry. The from current was a new word. Uh, by the way, I think uh, Microsoft might. Maybe they should be looking for UX people. I don't know if they know anybody. Um, I, I usually use Apple, so that's my problem. Uh, but uh, okay, so uh, the thing is, we want it done by January 10th, whatever it happens to be. And what you see there, that curve, that's a cost of delay. So if it's done January 11th or 10 at noon, not that big of an impact. The 12th. 15th, 20th, 30th, we start to lose a little bit. Maybe there's a fine, well, it'd be a different shape, but uh, you know, maybe somebody else has a product that our customers will ship to. Like Tim Cook gets on stage and says, this is going to be great, you're going to love it in a few weeks. And in that time, Google like, makes this major announcement about whatever Android thing, and people say, eh, I could stand in line for this Apple thing, but this Google thing is ready right now. So that's what that cost of delay is for uh, releasing late. So if we just you know, pick, pick a percentile, pick a service level agreement or a maximum, uh, or, yeah, maximum uh, lead time that we can accept without any complaints. And if in this case it's the 85th percentile, which was I think six, was it 40 days? 60 days. 60 days, that means you should start the work 60 days before January 10th. Is that correct? Is, what's that? Yeah. Some people have, have had bad consequences in their life, and so they manage risk. They're aware of risk, and they manage it. I'm one of them, too. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so you know, from the commitment point to the 85th percentile, it's this many days, you walk it back, that's November 11th, blah, blah, blah. Um, should, to, to make sure that you don't miss the date, should you start at 5,000 days early? No. no, right? So there's a window of the right time to start, right? So the, you know, to make sure that 85% you know, is 60 or 40 days or 60 days so start 60 days earlier that that that's kind of cutting it close because you're probably working on other stuff too and this morning there are, you know and other you know people talk about there's there's other things that come up that you have to do that you weren't expecting mm -hmm. right so there's that kind of stuff that should actually all be included in these lead time distributions but what they are included as is all those uh, points after the 85th percentile. So that stuff does happen. It is 85%, not 100%. Um, so yeah, starting too late, we know what the damage of that is. What might be this uh, damage of starting too early? Oops. What happens if you start this too early? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have a uh, something that looks like a 2015 model on the car lot in 2018. That 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 would be a concrete way of describing it. Market has already changed its mind, but you planned and started too early. Another is uh, uh, the cost of carry. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's say there's a ship date 
or like a, um, maybe this is a sale campaign for Easter weekend at a hotel, like hotel chain. Uh, if you start selling, if you prepare and do all the work to, to get that sales campaign done uh, before um, Christmas of the previous year, it means you've made that, all that investment and there's many months before you get any return on that. So that, that's actually a loss of money, financially speaking. So starting too early, it creates an inventory. Uh, even though it's done, done, right? Uh, yeah, those are two, two main things. Can somebody think of another reason why not to start something too early? Absolutely. Uh, market changes, but then there's other, other kind of learning, like uh, even internally. So for example, uh, um, uh, a department in your company does something to the platform that's not part of your product team. It's like, oh, wow, you know, we can do this in half the time now because of what they've just done. Or um, if you're talking about it, but you haven't started it yet, maybe one of these people in a meeting hears, oh, you're thinking about doing that. Oh, shoot. We, you know, we were going to do this infrastructure project, but we decided to delay it. But maybe we should do it because that will help your, your feature. So yeah, starting if you start, they don't have a choice anymore. But if you just talk about it and you're aware of it and you delay the start, other people can also prepare, including the sales team and the marketing team. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's another one. Uh, especially if you uh, you don't start and finish completely before you actually work on other stuff. One one reason people so why do people start work really early? Why do they start work too early? In general, your product managers. Why do you want engineers to get started right now? Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Why? Something else is coming up, so if they're still dilly-dallying on that old stuff, then the new stuff comes in, it's like, ah, so that's a problem. Uh, you know, can you rely on them? Can, would you have them go to the 85th percentile, like right on the margin, or no, you want a buffer? That's, that's another issue. Have you ever asked for stuff to get done, and they said, yeah, and it just, it's still not done yet? How many of those things are there? Can you count them? How many committed things are not done yet? That definitely don't take, what is it, like 100 days, 500 days? Literally 500 days? That still aren't done yet. So that's, those are very good reasons to, uh, very good reasons to start as early as possible. So one of the reasons to get predictability is so you can stop doing that. And then uh, not having 60 work items all in the backlog of the dev teams simultaneously with managers interrupting them, asking, stop working, listen to me, because I want to ask you, when is this going to be done? Yeah, that's, that's a typical scenario. Okay, uh, so yeah, th so there are some good reasons not to start too early. Obviously, we know why not to start too late. Uh, and I don't want to get into dependencies. But I think that's... That, yeah, just just to uh, close, that's um, that's the content. Uh, no, I want to go to the the distribution against the the start date. Where's that? No. Sorry. Okay. So questions? Oh, how do we arrive at the optimal start date? Can somebody explain it? Knowing, knowing this, no, like knowing that specific information, 60 days is 85 percentile. And if, you, if you look it up on the calendar, November 11th is 60 days earlier. Knowing that, how, how would you arrive at the, uh, what criteria or what considerations would you use to arrive at the optimal start date. Would be a question back to you. Yeah. 
Yeah, what considerations might there be? Well, let's make a list. Which would basically be the list you could use every single time from now on when you're thinking what would what could be or what should be the optimal start date, these considerations. Because that's there isn't there isn't one. It's it's always context dependent. And uh, that would be a manager's job. And a manager that can do that is gonna be asked to do it more and become an important manager. But uh, uh, I'm going to say optimal start range. There might be a date, but I think in reality, if you do all the math and you look at all this math stuff, you see these sort of curves that are like, uh, I can't really even explain that, but, it, but basically it's, there's a dip in the cost of delay. So like too early, it's not a delay, it's, it's, a, it's a cost of carry, and then too late is cost of delay. And somewhere in there, there you, you, you have an optimal trough of like a certain amount of time. It's not like one specific day. But anyway, what would, what would be, I uh, uh, hope this is the right one. What would be some considerations for picking the, picking the day? Okay. Yeah, that'd be one consideration. Yeah, 85th percentile, but the manager that like cracks the whip to get that 85 is not here this week. So maybe I, I can't calculate what the number of days that is, but I can just, you know, I can do something about that. Yeah, trust. Whatever the reason is. A lot of the trust uh, that you might normally need, you don't need, once you get these, uh, especially the more data points. You only need five or so to get this curve, and it's actually very reliable. And of course, add more data points, it's even more reliable. And of course, if you have one of these that's 10 years old, it's probably not very useful today, so it's like recent past for the recent future. But uh, at relatively soon, trust is not even really part of the issue anymore. Because this, this has nothing to do with what they say. It's only what they do. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So uh, other considerations for uh, like the optimal start date. So if uh, going, going from the uh, analogous start date, which has some issues or like yeah. basically from the time scale, uh -huh. can be seen what other risks can be based on working to the time scale to take into yeah, think about different risks. What's one kind of risk? It was actually on a section I didn't get into because that, that's like a two-day course, but uh, the, you saw the header for it and then I backed off. I don't know if you read it. Started with letter D. Yeah, dependencies. So it's a new feature, but this is a new feature that has a dependency on a team that's not my team, separate those out, that's a type of work. Then you don't have to worry about those anymore. This is a new feature with a dependency. Oh, okay, so that's 85th percentile is X many days. This does not have a dependency, X minus whatever number of days. That, that's the purpose of differentiating these work items. So you have to find a way to, to but, determine the 85th percentile for each, like you were saying, the first box is type of work, and then how you yeah. It's just based on what your own team, however you define risk or how are, how, uh, how risk, you risk is identifying the type. I'd say risk and especially uh, the term, you know, the combine community talks about is tail risk. So basically what it means is how, how tall is that? So remember, uh, I had, I had a tail risk. I had a big, big tail there. Uh, because because I, I stopped it here. So anyway, what this means is, it just means this curve is shaped like that, as opposed to like that. Or is that a new curve? Because that's part of the question. Uh, well, you, you change the curve by removing some data mm -hmm. is the main thing. So it's like, oh, let's get rid of those dependent types of work. 
So you, you, you want to squish. I didn't say this. I should have said this. You want that kind of shape as much as you can get. You want a very tall, steep, and a very thin, thin, thin tail. There might be stuff out here. That just always happens. Like maybe we stopped caring about it for a year or so, and then we finally got it done. Well, you know, it doesn't really impact. You know. But uh, so remove data. Another is, uh, you know, improves the workflow and the processes. That'll shift everything over there too. But uh, so about the, the risk, and I mentioned tail risk, the reason I did that is, um, uh, well, what will cause the risk is one thing, but, but what is the impact of the risk? Which is most, mostly what we're looking at is just delay. And that's why we call it tail risk. So there might be like financial risk or like reputation risk or legal risk, you know, just like non-compliance. But what we're, 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 we're focusing on is like, when is this going to be done? So it's the risk of having this thing take longer than 60 days. Well, we're promising 60 or less. Not 60, we're promising 60 or less, by the way. If it takes more than that, what's the risk of that happening? What's the risk of this work item being in that 15%? So uh, for all the different work types, what, co what contributes to this. One thing you can do is just look in the records of what, what was different about all of these compared to that. Maybe you can't find anything else, and that's just why so statistically 15% of them are that. That's just that. So risk management wise, you can say, well, this is a standard uh, new feature, like all those others, we were happy with 85% certainty. But this one feature, it's like, it's, it's a little bit more important and different than these. It's not because of its due date or anything else. It just matters more. If we, we talk to a customer, which you should call it a due date. But we, we made some kind of a promise. Well, maybe you decide for this one, we want to go to 95% certainty. So if this was 60 days, what is this going to be? Something like 100, 120. So you start way earlier. But the, you know, the question is, when do we start the stuff? But the, 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 the skill, the capability to know when you should start some stuff is the ability to generate these. So do you remember how do we create these curves? What's the first, what's one input we need to be able to make one of these curves? Start date, yeah. Yeah. Or you said something started? Oh, something yeah. Started. So, yeah, you need a thing. You need a thing and, 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 and it's starting it. And then anything else? Or there is more? <laughs> yeah, finish date. So you need a thing, a start date, and a finish date. And then what do you do with that information? So uh, you can imagine that's a, a row, thing. Column one, start date, column two, finish date. And if you have ever made one of these kind of curves or charts in Excel, just do that. Time and number. Actually, it's, uh, it's to, to actually do it in Excel, there's one more column, which is like total, total lead time. But that's it. Does that make sense? So this is, let me tell you a story how this was first used by the people who taught me. Is uh, these, This was a, the, like the best project team in, uh, I forget, uh, Pune? I, I, not, it's not Pune, but somewhere in India. Best, best like CMMI level five team. Microsoft was like having problems with their internal tools and maintenance and support of those. So they're like, uh, let's outsource this stuff. Because first of all, they're taking forever and they're expensive. So you might as well have it be cheaper, taking forever. Work took forever. 105 days average lead time for a, like a change request. After lots of analysis, they found out some of these change requests are adding a comma to a page. Some of these change requests are changing a photo on a facilities management page. Some of these were updating all the tax tables to payroll everyone at Microsoft. So these are different orders of magnitude in the change request. But they're all going in there and they all had to be estimated 
And if uh, the, the estimates had to be 24 hours, no, I'm sorry, two days to do all estimates. And a team of like, I think it was five, three developers, three QA, and uh, 80, 80 different systems. And so uh, you can imagine the, the backlog piled up. And so when they, you know, they, they, they started looking at this stuff, they could see the 85th percentile was 105 days. So they, they changed a couple of things. One of them was no more estimates. So an estimate required a developer to estimate. And the rule was basically getting the work done is important. The service level agreement is estimates have to be done in two days. And they have to be highly accurate. You know what highly accurate estimates means. They had to be highly accurate. So you can imagine if you're trying to like get countless amounts of change requests done on 80 different systems with two partners, and randomly people say, here's two days of dedicated work you have to do, interrupting you constantly. And I think it was less than half of the work that they did estimate got approved to be done. Because there's all sorts of reasons. A lot of it is because it would take too long based on a policy of how long like a project should take for budgeting. Other cases, it, it's just, they just were curious. They weren't committed to having it done. So by taking this and this, this 85 thing, they, by, by looking at some of the historical information, primarily the times where they weren't interrupted and they could just do a start to finish, plus separating the different kinds of work out, chroma changes from like tax table updates, they were able to go, so the, this manager of this group could go back to the business owners and say, hey, how about I make you an offer? You no longer ask us to estimate stuff, and we can guarantee 30 days or less for any request. And so you can imagine an average of 105 days is how long it usually took to finish the work, which based on the shapes of these curves, some of the stuff was like, 500 days, 600 days, 1,000 days, or never done. So to go from that, and who knows? Is it going to be two days? Is it going to be 105 days? I don't know. To go from that from guaranteed 30 days or less, do you think the managers were like, yeah, sure, stop estimating? Or were they like, no, no, I want you to estimate, and I don't care if it's an unknown, number, an unknown amount of time beyond 30 days. I don't care about that. You, which do you think happened? Obviously, a dumb question, but so uh, this is a alternative way to estimate. It's not like it's not estimated. It's prob it's probabilistic forecasting. It's estimating um, what date something will be done, not how long it will take. Just estimating what date it will be done, and that what that also informs you of what state should we start. But like how big it is or how much effort it's going to take, you don't get any of that. So any benefits you get from an estimation process, you're not going to get from this. And I would also suggest that the people who do estimation don't necessarily even need to be involved in this. So you might be estimating stories. And as a product manager or a business group, you might just do this for epics or uh, you know, uh, feature requests from customers. So for example, a, a table of types of work and a little bit of training for the account managers. So when Bank of America calls Visa and says, yeah, I want you to do this with the thing, they can go, oh, it's this kind of work. Yeah, it should take this much time, or we'll bill you this much money. What do you think? That, that's what this can do for you. Can you ask what the cost is? Yes. And how, and how you qualify. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I uh, forgot to hammer that point home. Uh, this is uh, it's just something that, that I've, I've started to really realize more and more that um, managers uh, should spend their time on differentiating types of work, including periodically reviewing, studying the tail, studying the difference between this half and this half, uh, and just paint like, are these similar? 
can we group them together to simplify all of our management overhead? Should we separate these? Uh, and then, uh, how much time do we have? We're done, I think. Yeah, because uh, um, I, I, can't, I can't introduce the topic, but I'll, I'll label it, it class of service is a, a, a tool that helps you say, given a type of work, you can separate it by class of service. So for example, type of work flying you from San Francisco to Seattle. First class, economy, standby, and, and the classes of service, are, they operate very similar to that. So um, what, are these, what should the classes be? What should the policies be about those classes? Basically, how do you treat the work? And what are the different kinds of work? And really focusing on that kind of stuff. So you know, let, let, let developers allocate their resources the way they need to, based on the estimation, based on their assessment of the skills, the, 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 the average throughput of teams. But for answering questions like, when can you give me this? Uh, I, I'd apply this. And you can do that totally independent from any estimation process. Okay.